So I'm Covey and I'll be giving you your lecture on um, the virology stuff. Um, and I sort of um, focused largely on sort of high yield MCQE stuff. Um, but if you have any questions, my email's at the bottom or feel free to interrupt as well. Um, I just wanted to check because I was just, I don't know if you overheard me say to Yethrib, um, I've um, got some notes on my other screen. Um, so it would be better for me if I didn't share full screen, but I just wanted to check that you guys could see what I was sharing. Um, if you can't, let me know and I can go full screen. Okay, I've got one. Yep, that is good. Um, um, but yeah, if you if it gets bad, um, then just let me know. Um, okay, so um, if we get started. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's largely high yield stuff. Um, but any questions, just interrupt. So to begin with, I just thought I'd focus on the virology stuff in general, as opposed to specific viruses. Um, so I was wondering if anyone felt comfortable, um, you can either message on the chat or um, speak that we are being recorded. Um, if you know any of the components that make up a virus. Um, I'll take that as not quite ready to share now, so that's fine. That's good. Yep, capsid is definitely one. Thanks. Okay, um, I'll get on to the next section, but yes, capsid is definitely one. So that's the protein coat, um, and that often has a repeating subunit structure. Um, and then you have a lip, some viruses do have a lipid membrane um, and it's often from the host cell itself. So in replication, the host cell membrane becomes the viral envelope. Um, and then, as you know, there's a genome, the nucleic acid genome. Um, and um, they also have, um, some have envelopes and some don't. So does anyone know any examples of enve enveloped viruses or non-enveloped viruses? I'll give you guys half a minute and then we'll get moving. And obviously feel free to shout out if you do feel comfortable. Okay, so some examples of, um, oh, in, really good. Yep, influenza is enveloped. Um, and other examples are HIV, HCV, herpes. Um, and non-enveloped ones are polio, adenovirus, HPV, etc. And lastly, the main thing you need to know about the components is how viruses attach and ent enter into our cells because they can't independently metabolize or divide. Um, so they rely a lot on heparin sulfate proteoglycan or glycan um, sialic acid. Um, and different viruses use different methods. So um, norovirus, dengue, et cetera, use heparin sulfate um, and influenza mumps um, use glycan sialic acid. Don't feel, feel like you have to take notes. These slides will be shared with you. Um, so just sort of go along for the ride, as it were. Um, so the next section I was going to focus on um, the classification system that's used for viruses. So um, does anyone know the name of the classification system we use? Don't worry, I don't expect you to know the specific details yet. Yeah, perfect. It's the Baltimore classification. Um, so I feel like that's a good one to learn for MCQs just because it's very easy for them to test. Um, and uh, as an FYI, we've got some questions on this um, within the feedback form at the end um, with answers as well that you have access to. So if you fill that out, you'll get that. Um, but just as a quick summary of the classification system, it's group one to seven. And it's classified based on um, what sort of genetic material form it takes, whether it's positive or negative, um, and has a big focus on how the virus um, replicates. So, for example, just so you can understand my system, it's group one viruses um, can be DNA. It, they are DNA, but they can be positive or negative strands. 
can they replicate through nuclear replication and so on and so forth. So group one viruses um, would be your adenoviruses, your herpes viruses. Then group two is DNA positive. So they are mostly nuclear replication and those are your parvoviruses. Um, group four is RNA, um, which is positive, and that is then transcribed to negative um, RNA. Um, and that's your polio, your dengue, your norovirus. Group five is RNA negative, which can be directly transcribed to mRNA, um, which is things like influenza, measles, and mumps. And then group six is RNA positive. So this requires a reverse transcriptase um, to make the DSDNA. And we'll look at this more when we look at HIV specifically, because that comes up a lot in our course. And lastly, group seven is DNA again, positive or negative, and then RNA intermediate is made using the reverse transcriptase. So that's um, things like HBV, which we will also look at. So then we've moved on to the patterns of viral infection. So this is just a quick graph and the, uh, where I got it from is at the bottom of the screen of how um, different life cycles, as it were, of um, viral infection. So some have a very acute period and then go away, which is your rhinovirus, your rotavirus and the flu. And then some rely on a more latent pattern of infection, such as herpes. Um, some are pers persistent but asymptomatic, which is things like the JC virus. And some are persistent but pathogenic. And the very classic example of that is HIV. So you have your initial spike, a bit where it sort of bubbles away, and then another spike, which leads often to death. And then the last slide on general viruses is um, just some definitions that I think are quite useful for MCQs. Um, so viral um, tropism, multiplicity of infection, and these phases, um, I think, are quite useful to learn just so, um, I think it's part A's? Yeah, the part A's. Um, so a viral virus's tropism is a permissive cell or tissue. Um, the multiplicity of infection is the number of infectious particles per cell. Um, the eclipse phase is the period that's um, immediately after an infection happens just before a new virus is produced. Um, the burst size is the number of new infectious particles produced by this infected cell, and a defective virus is essentially something that's non-infectious. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick rattle through, but you can have a look in your own time, but just read this the night before the exam or something, and it could be quite useful. So moving on, we start with influenza. Um, so, Starting with an introduction. So influenza, I'm sure you're all familiar with the general concept, and it can come in seasonal versus pandemic um, outbreaks, um, which I'm sure we are all too familiar with. Um, so the seasonal epidemics tend to be more limited outbreaks, which happen every winter, which you come across in the UK. Um, and the um, out upcoming disease is unpleasant, but generally not fatal. Um, and it's actually annually responsible for 250,000 to 500,000 deaths worldwide. So it is something people do die of. Um, and pandemics um, appear more unpredictably every 20 years or so. Um, and they spread rapidly and globally, as we're seeing. Um, and more infections means more deaths occur. Um, and um, yeah. So then moving on to the structure of influenza. So it consists of a lipid envelope um, and inside there's negative stranded RNA, as we've sort of run through already, made of viral ribonuclear protein complexes, which are arranged in a seven plus one structure. This is also quite useful because that's a question they like to ask in MCQs. And um, the big thing that sort of differentiates the different types of influenza are the surface antigens, um, which are hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Um, and they um, essentially define the different types. And there's 18 different types of HA um, and 11 different types of um, NA. Um, and they're also responsible for this concept of antigen, um, the antigenic changes of the influenza virus and the concept of drift versus shift. So drift is are the gradual changes that you see in the antigenic makeup of the circulating virus. Um, and they're caused by a small number of amino acid changes, so nothing too dramatic and nothing too different. Whereas the shift is a very major change in the antigenicity of the virus. 
um, and the virus contains a whole new gene for HA or sometimes for NA. Um, and it's usually because of crossover from avian or animal viruses. And um, it's known as a reassortment of the influenza virus. And that's when it gets to be more infectious or cause more death. And I made note of the replication cycle there, um, just because they do like asking questions on the influenza's replication cycle. But I think it's often quite useful to just sort of write um, how it happens down for yourself. Me reading it out probably won't help so much, but just as a quick summary, it initially begins with binding to the silic acid receptor and then endocytosis and then acidification of the endosome and then nuclear import, transcription and replication, nuclear export, um, and then viral release by budding. And this is where neuraminidase comes in. Um, and all, a lot of these stages rely on the host um, being present. So the virus entry requires on a host, the release of the VRMP relies on a host, and obviously, as you know, transcription and replication and virus budding rely on a host. So um, it's just good to remember those stages as well. So can anyone um, write down on the chat um, the sites where um, influenza affects us? So sort of clinically in the body where it affects us. Yeah, good, nasopharynx. Yeah, upper respiratory tract. You guys know your stuff. Um, so the site of entry is the respiratory tract, of, um, mainly upper airway and the ciliated cells. And it does usually remain restricted to the lungs. Um, the virus's replication process often damages the ciliated epithelium um, and then allows easy entry of bacteria into the lower respiratory tract, which is why you often see um, a bacterial pneumonia coming on after flu. Um, and in terms of the immune response, you get an innate and adaptive immune response with the innate being mainly interferon and the adaptive being antibody and cell mediated. And the sort of flu-like symptoms that you classically get are due to the um, interferon response. So in terms of the vaccine, this is another good high yield thing to learn is there's two different types. There's the inactivated vaccine and the live attenuated vaccine. So the inactivated one um, relies on humoral immunity a lot, and it tends to be more strain specific, um, and its effect is sort of quite variable based on age, and that's the one we get. And then there's a live attenuated one, which relies on cellular and humoral immunity, again, is strain specific, but um, is the one that's given to children. Um, and traditionally, they're developed in embryonated chicken eggs, which is why um, you get this when you come up to the clinical school. Whenever you give someone a flu vaccine, you have to check if they have an allergy. Um, and the decision as to what sort of, because you can't start target all strains, the, the decision as to which strain you target um, is made, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere in February, um, which is why often sometimes the vaccine might not work because these predictions are being made by people so far before when we see the strains um, and when the vaccine is given to us, which is you know, October, November time. Um, so that's my quick rundown of influenza. Any questions, just put into the chat. Um, I'm now going to move on to um, hepatitis. Okay. Um, so I've just gone through sort of the different types of um, hepatitis and how they are um, transmitted and basically just a quick summary of all of them. But before I move on to that, can someone put on the chat any of the um, symptoms that you get in acute hepatitis? Or if you, yeah, jaundice, yeah, that's a good one. And any sort of changes in enzymes that we might see might be a good one. Yep, good, good. ALT is raised. Um, and does anyone know the different types of hepatitis? Have you come across any? I'm sure you had to have a vaccine for at least one of them before we before we join the med school. Yeah, 
B and C, good, yeah. Um, and they're the most common ones, and they're the ones I've sort of delved into in more detail, just because it's what is more prevalent, I suppose, in where we live. So as you very correctly pointed out, um, acute hepatitis, you generally start by feeling a little unwell, nausea and vomiting is often seen, enlarged liver, um, jaundice, as you pointed out, um, and then you see this pale stool dark urine because of bilirubin derangement, and your ALT is also raised, as you pointed out. So if we just go in alphabetical order, so hepatitis A is, um, so it's fecal oral, um, and it generally produces quite mild symptoms. Um, it's non-chronic, so you don't then pr proceed to chronic hepatitis from it. Um, and the marker for it is IgM. And there is a vaccine available, um, but it's not really given um, in the part of the world we live in, but it is um, available in other parts. Um, and then moving on to hepatitis B, I presume that's a vaccine that most of us got. Um, working in a healthcare setting. So it's passed on parentally, um, often mother to child. Um, and um, most people do manage to clear the acute version quite well, but 5% of adults and the majority of infected children do end up becoming carriers, which is why um, there's a big push to sort of prevent mother to child spread, because if you get it acquired as a child, there's a much higher risk of you becoming a chronic carrier. Um, and in terms of um, carriers, so they have viral DNA and viral antigen present, um, and they can be a high or a low level carrier. So a high level carrier tends to be more infectious, and they have a higher risk of progressing to um, chronic hepatitis and cancer. Um, and they have quite chronic T cell responses. So they will be H, so if you're a high level carrier, you are HPV antigen positive and HPV antibody negative. Whereas if you're a low level carrier, which is more as you progress more chronically with the illness, you are HPV antigen negative and antibody positive. So you'll note that it's flipped. So when you're high level, you've got the antigen, but not the antibody. When you're low level, it's the reverse. And you have to treat it because um, uh, you don't want them to prog progress into sort of getting liver cancer. So you try to treat it at the level of when they have chronic hepatitis. Um, and as you know, there is a vaccine, but you also use pegylated interferon as the treatment to prevent it. Um, and then moving on to sepsi, which is again spread parenterally. So um, IBDUs at are at increased risk of getting it. Um, it's quite, um, people do get it iatrogenically in other countries where um, needle safety or hygiene is perhaps not as good as here. Um, and there are other at risk groups of people who are HIV positive or MSM. Um, and in terms of uh, how it works, 85% um, become carriers, so it's much more likely to go chronic. Um, and there's um, a big T cell response, which has been shown to be quite important for clearance and therefore um, in terms of vaccine development, uh, T cell response is thought to be vital. Um, and there, there are therapeutics um, for it, so it relies on a combination of protease inhibitors and ribavirin. Um, and I've got a little bit um, of a table that helps you sort of figure out where these therapeutics act, which will you be given in the slides. Um, but as a sort of clue, if it's a protease inhibitor, it ends in Privir. If it's a polymerase inhibitor, it ends in Guvir. Um, and if it's an NS5A um, agent, then it um, ends in Asvir. But this table will be in the notes, so you can get it from there. Um, and then we're moving on to the herpes viruses. Um, so can anyone tell me a little bit? Baltimore calls they fall into. Just shut up. Or if you could just list some examples of any herpes viruses that you know within the chat. Yep, good. Chicken box EBV. Okay, that's good. Well done. Um, so I started with a little bit of an introduction. 
Uh, yeah, cytomegalovirus, good. Um, so if we start off with a bit of an introduction, there are um, three subfamilies, so alpha, beta, and gamma. And they um, have sort of different properties and different ways they interact with the body. Um, so if you start with the alpha, they tend to be neurotrophic and have a more acute disease, um, and then go on to become latent, and they are recurrent. Um, and then beta ones um, have a more mild disease, they're not fully latent, um, and they're often reactivated when someone becomes immunosuppressed. And lastly, the gamma ones um, have a more latent course and um, have an increased risk of oncogenesis. In terms of the Baltimore classification, they're type one, so with linear DSDNA. Um, and in terms of the structure, all you really need to know is it consists of an icosahedral protein capsule. Um, I think someone might be unmuted. Um, so if you could try and mute yourself, just because I think there's some sort of echo. But um, yeah, so it's this, in terms of structure, it's an icosahedral protein capsid coated in um, a viral tegument protein, as I've said, with a lipid bilayer envelope. Um, and it has 170 genes. These are just sort of the stuff that you might get asked in the MCQ. And then moving on to the types of H23, I thought I'd sort of lay it out this way because this is how they sort of ask your question. So if we start with um, one and two, um, they're both alpha. Um, and they are referred to as herpes simplex viruses one and two. So if we look into one, so it tends to be largely from close contact infection um, and the virus localizes to the lips. So that's sort of how you get cold sores and it stays latent in your trigeminal ganglion. Um, whereas type two um, relies on sexual transmission and that is basically genital herpes. Um, and its latency is to the sacral ganglion, so it sort of makes sense in terms of where it localizes. Um, and then type 3, as one of you pointed out, is VZV, VZV um, so that's virus and zoster, um, and that's an alpha type, um, and that gives you chickenpox, often on first presentation, and shingles um, later on down the line. Um, and it's transmitted um, because uh, through coughs and sneezes because it's airborne. Um, type 4 is EBV, which I think one of you mentioned as well, um, and that's a gamma type. Um, it often tends to be asymptomatic with um, sort of 90% of the world being carriers, um, but in some people it can present with glandular fever, which people sometimes get, especially at the start of uni and things like that. Um, and then type 5, is a beta type, um, and that's CMV, which another one of you said, so that's cytomegalovirus. Um, and the initial presentation tends to be asymptomatic or a sort of mild primary infection. Um, and again, it's spread by body fluids. Type six and seven, I'll just quickly go over, um, but they don't come up so much. And they're type beta, and they're the rosiola viruses. Um, and the main thing to say about them is sometimes they can give a sort of transient rash in um, babies. Um, and the last one is type 8 HVG, which is a gamma virus. Um, and this is the one that's associated with Kaposi's sarcomas, um, which we will come on to later. But they're a type of cancer associated with um, uh, HIV. Uh, so that's just another connection. Um, in terms of these, I think this is sort of all the main stuff you need to know. Um, just one more thing I would say is um, a question they like to ask is in terms of the histology of CMV, so that's uh, type 5, um, you, they use a descriptor of large binucleate owl eye cells, um, which is very classic of what you'd see on the microscope with CMV. So if you just remember that phrase, which is again in the notes, then um, that should help you localize it to being HHV5. And next on our whistle top tour is um, latent infection and sort of tumor viruses. Um, so do, can anyone list off some tumor viruses that they know? Or just post them on the chat. Yeah, good. HPV, classic one that lots of people are vaccinated against. Is 
Okay, um, I'll move on, but feel free to post it on the chat. So firstly, I thought we'd start by sort of talking about how this comes about. Um, so there's a range of different ways that viruses in, induce tumours in the host. Um, yep, EBV, uh, definitely. Um, so some benign tumours um, are sort of induced as part of the normal cycle of infection that viruses undertake. Um, and But malignant tumours are obviously rarer because um, viruses don't want to give their host, um, as it were, um, a tumour. So it's an accidental consequence of viral infection and they offer no advantage to the virus really. Um, it doesn't fit in with sort of any natural selection. Um, and immunodeficiency in the host often increases the incidence of um, this tumour conversion. Um, and it often, um, which is why in um, late stage AIDS and things like that, um, people are far more prone to these tumour viruses um, because their body is just less able to fight it off. So again, these are the sort, the more common ones, um, which some of you have already picked up on. So HH4 or EBV um, increases um, the risk of lymphoma and is also associated with nasopharyngeal carcinomas, uh, so head and neck cancers. Um, HHV8, we've already mentioned, is associated with Kaposi sarcoma, um, which is associated with HIV as well. Um, and then HBV and HCV are uh, associated with hepatocellular carcinoma, so it sort of goes the acute hepatitis, and then you get more chronic hepatitis, and then you go into the cirrhosis carcinoma side. Um, and HPV, as one of you mentioned, um, increases um, your risk of a host of different carcinomas, so cervical, anogenital papillomas, and head and neck carcinomas. Um, and we, uh, a lot of young people nowadays are in, vaccinated against the HPV, 16 and 18 strains, which increase the risk of cervical cancer. Uh, sorry, so the strains increase the risk and the vaccine um, has been really useful in reducing people getting infected by it and therefore the risk of cervical cancer. Um, and then HGLV1 is associated with adult T-cell leukemia. And then these, the last two are just sort of points to remember. Um, MC polyoma virus is associated with Markov cell carcinoma. Um, and the last um, big virus that we're going to talk about, which is a bit of a bumper topic, um, is HIV and AIDS. So does anyone know anything about the structure of HIV um, or what Baltimore group it's in? If you feel comfortable, please just post in the chat. Yep, group six, well done. A few of you said it, so <laughs> great. Um, and we'll move on and look a little bit into the structure. So as a lot of you correctly pointed out, it is Baltimore group six, so it has SSRNA positive. Um, and it consists of five prime and three prime. The structure consists of five prime and three prime long terminal repeat, of which the virus uses to integrate into the host cell genome. Um, and they also contain enhancer and promoter elements, which aid the transcription of, vi of the viral genome. I'm sure this is all um, in your memory from genetics in first year. Um, and they, it also has a capsid, um, which protects the two single positive RNA strands um, in a sort of pyramid shape. Um, and a lipid envelope, which is taken from the host cell itself. So um, its um, genomic data is sort of organised in these open reading frames, um, which may, which are so called because the genes essentially overlap. Um, and it consists, the main ones you need to know about are the structural and the accessory proteins. So the structural proteins are GAV, POL and N, and the accessory proteins are TAP, REV and NEF. Um, does anyone want to know um, what the different proteins do? Um, I'm not going to ask about a specific one, but if you know about one, just write it down and sort of say what it does. Neff 
Yes, so NEF is, um, does downregulate MHC molecules, so it's part of the immune evasion. GAG, yep, yeah, it's structural. Capsid, yep, yeah, good, good. You guys are really good at this. <laughs> um, amazing. So, as some of you said, let's start with GAG. Um, so, that creates GAG protein, which is encoded by GAG, and it's sort of involved in the organization, as you've shown. It protects the genome and the enzymes with the capsid in the envelope. It chaperones the RNA and is involved in budding as well. Coal um, is um, in charge of sort of the reverse transcriptase, which is used in the replication. Um, ENS um, is responsible for the surface or transmembrane glycoprotein, which is involved in the receptor binding um, and the fusion between the virus and the cell membrane. And then moving on to the accessory proteins, as one of you said, NEF is involved in the immune evasion using um, targeting MHC. Um, REV is in, involved in regulating the RNA splicing of the virus. Um, and CAP is involved in transactivating viral gene transcription. So the names sort of do correlate. So if you can sort of find some memory aids, probably using that. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, so in terms of the life cycle, it's very, I don't want to sort of read it out as I did for influenza, but it's just a good thing to sort of keep in mind and I'll include it in the notes for you to write your own summary with, um, but I don't think it's very helpful for someone to read it out to you. Um, another concept that um, I wanted to explore was the viral tropisms. So the two different types are um, M and T type. Um, so M tropic viruses are considered to be R5 viruses. So they target the CCR5 receptor for entry um, and they infect macrophages and mature CD4 T cells, which have these receptors, um, and they don't induce non-sensitia. Whereas T tropic viruses um, are the X4 viruses and they target the CXCR4 um, receptor for entry. So then they're able to infect naive T cells and they do induce sensitivity. Um, so basically, the difference is M type target R5, T type target X4. Um, but some viruses actually can target both receptors and they're known as R5X4. Um, and often what happens with them is as the infection in, ind in an individual progresses, the viruses tend to sort of go from targeting R5, um, which are the older ones, to using R5X4, to then just using X4 and just targeting naive T cells as the um, more mature T cells have died off. Um, and another important thing that the HIV virus does that's important to note is the fact that it sp spreads um, through cell to cell through virological synapses, um, which is a concept um, that's kind of useful to get your head around. So they form between uh, DC and CD4 T cells um, to transfer the um, HIV uh, variant. Um, and this is what they refer to as like an infection focus. I don't know if you've come across that phrase. Um, and it's sort of how HIV sort of um, spreads within an individual when initially there's a low number of virus particles. So they form these virological synapses, um, which allow it to spread from cell to cell much easier. And lastly, um, another big concept in terms of HIV are the various viral enzymes it has. So the big three are your reverse transcriptase, your integrase, and your protein. Does anyone want to post on the chat what they think any of those three enzymes do? Yeah, good. So, how do you replicate genome, RNA to DNA? A few of you said that. Good for insertion into the host. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, for integrates, integrates viral C DNA into host genome. Guys, very good at this. So, yeah, you're right. So, two of you mentioned reverse transcriptase. So, as you said, um, it sort of replicates the genome and converts the RNA form into a DNA form 
before it um, integrates into the host genome itself. Um, and it's often the target for a lot of antiretroviral therapies. Um, and it consists of two subunits. Um, and one is where the DNA is produced by subunit P56. The RNA is then degraded by subunit P51. So P56 produces the DNA and P51 degrades. Um, and then, as another one of you said, integrates, um, if it integrates the viral DNA, cDNA into the host genome. And lastly, protease. Um, so it's essentially, um, uh, its function was sort of identified by inhibition of pole, preventing maturation of variants um, into an infectious form. So it's involved in that. Um, and protease inhibitors like RT inhibitors are also an important component of um, ART for HIV. Um, and then moving on to the transmission. So it relies, the transmission of HIV relies a lot on mucosal transmission. So in terms of the stages, initially it has to cross the epithelial barrier um, and often it helps to have sort of weaker bits of skin or um, uh, portions where there are erosions to aid um, this. And then there's single genome amplification and then dissemination of the virus. Um, and it can spread within two to three weeks. I've got a little bit of a um, graph at the bottom, which again, it might be a bit small, but it looks bigger um, on, on the slides. And um, the blue portion is the number of CD4s, um, and the red portion is the amount of HIV RNA. So it's a sort of um, uh, negative factor on each other. So as a viral, uh, viral RNA increases, the CD4 number decreases because that's what they're attacking. Um, in terms of the acute infection phase, some people might not even notice, but it tends to be quite flu-like, symptoms feeling really run down, um, they tend to be quite systemic, um, but you can also get, you know, like respiratory symptoms and GI upsets as well. And in terms of the factors that influence the transmission, it tends to be viral load. So if someone is newly infected or not on any sort of therapeutic for their HIV, then they'll have a higher viral load, which leads to um, greater transmission, the epithelial integrity. So that's what I sort of meant by lacerations and stuff. So um, thinner epithelium allow easier penetration. Um, and then co-infection. So if someone has HPV alongside, that influences transmission and the genetics of the host. So different people just provide different vectors. Um, and then the factors that influence the progression tends to be immune activation, so the body's response, the viral load sort of affects both, the host genetics as well, and then the immune response that um, the host has. In terms of pathogenesis, um, uh, so there's a big, um, a big portion of it is GALT inflammation. So HIV-1 especially homes to the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Um, and then around this, there's um, inflammation and apoptosis of the CD4 cells within this tissue, uh, release of viral pumps, and then this long-term tissue damage um, leads to this sort of leaky gut. Um, and this is one of the things that ART targets and shows its response by reducing this long-term tissue damage. Um, and in terms of the mechanism that drives the progression of HIV to AIDS, it's the CD4 death that we can see in the previous slide. Um, and then that leads to reduced T cell hope, help to activate B cells. And then the loss of the mucosal barrier, the T cells, T cells are exhausted and the loss of the lymphoid tissue, all of this uh, proceeds to change the illness from HIV infection to this um, acquired immunodeficiency. Um, and lastly, on a more positive note, um, there are vaccines and therapeutics that people are developing. So therapeutics are around, and I'm sure a lot of you know, um, are utilised quite heavily and have proven to be very effective. Um, in terms of vaccines, there's two different types that are in development. They're the antibody-based type. Um, and the CTL-based type. So the antibody-based type rely on preventing infection full stop. So they rely on a sort of sterilizing immunity. So you won't get 
HIV essentially. So um, their targets are the GP120 subunit um, or a whole protein or even a polypeptide. Um, whereas the CTL based vaccines sort of control the viral replication, so they don't have a sterilizing immunity and they target the antigens GAG, POL, um, NEF, and they put them into vectors such as adenovirus. Um, and that's how they're based. Um, and a lot of the work is done here um, in Oxford with Adrian Hill's group and things like that. So if you're interested, definitely email them. Um, and then lastly, therapy and prophylaxis, which has sort of been a real game changer um, in how HIV is managed and how HIV is perceived today. Um, but it's good to remember that it's uh, not the same all over. So we have a lot of privilege that people across the world don't. Um, but this game changer has been through the form of um, essentially antiretroviral therapy. Um, and as I mentioned and alluded to a little bit before, they target different enzymes. So um, some target fusion or entry um, enzymes, so that they tend to be fusion entry inhibitors and they're sort of given 72 hours after exposure and they tend to be almost 100% effective. Um, and then you have reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which either are like NRTIs or NNRTIs, integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, um, which prevent the maturation of GAG or pole. So in terms of this, um, the approach is to use multi-drug therapy to prevent immune evasion as a, as a, as a sort of um, evasion by the virus, essentially. Um, so the idea is the virus may be able to evade one of these, but if you have two, it's harder for it to evade, and then if it has three, it's harder to evade. So that's the basis behind ART. Um, and just lastly, on the note of ART, um, there's your conventional ART that you are on once you find out that you have HIV and you're sort of essentially on it for life. Um, and then there's pre-exposure, which is um, people who are at risk of it, um, uh, um, are identified to be at risk of um, possibly being infected, receive it, and that's found to be 40% effective. And post-exposure is the sort of within that time frame, 72 hours or roughly, um, after you believe that you could have had a potential exposure. If you're given it, it's found to be almost 100% effective within um, 72 hours. And that completes my presentation. Um, my... Um, yeah, Yathrib's yeah, just posted on the chat, um, but thank you so much for coming. Um, any questions, if they're general questions, then email the preclinical revision um, email. If you have any questions about the topic itself, email me, and please, please complete the feedback just so we can give you better lectures and be better lecturers. And there are some questions within the feedback thing as well, so there is a benefit to you, questions and answers, so you can see what you've learned, um, and yeah, any questions, let me know.